Go ahead and share your screen. Get your tech savvy going. Okay. Hey. <laughs> nice. Um, can you guys see that okay? Or should I? Is that okay? All right. Um, so let me. So, you know, thinking about what, what do we know about diabetes and cirrhosis? We do know that people with cirrhosis, 30% of them have diabetes. Obviously not 30% of people with diabetes have cirrhosis, but 30% of people with cirrhosis have diabetes. What meds are safe, which meds are less safe, and what meds might actually not just be safe, but uh, be, be helpful in someone with cirrhosis. So type two diabetes is actually a risk factor uh, for fibrosis. And fibrosis is the scar tissue, and what happens in cirrhosis is just turned to a big wad of scar tissue. So the liver can't do all the things it's supposed to do. It's just scar tissue, and that's what causes the complications of cirrhosis. So having diabetes, for some reason, accelerates this fibrosis process, no matter what liver disease the patient has. So if they did have alcoholic liver disease, they're going to be more likely to get cirrhosis if they have diabetes. If they get fatty liver, they're going to be more likely to progress to cirrhosis if they have diabetes. And that's most likely what Robin's patient had. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. I didn't plan on it, but I'm going to throw it in. And then it, if they have one of the hepatitis B or hepatitis C, the same thing. So unfortunately, with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, some people actually have normal uh, ALTs and ASTs. And some people say, you know, if the patient's even at risk, an ALT or AST over 18 to 20 should be considered abnormal, or that you have to use other ways of detecting it, like uh, the, the, the scans that they're now doing with the pressure on the liver or just a plain old ultrasound. Uh, but but it's, a, it's probably the most common cause of what we call cryptogenic uh, cirrhosis, where somebody just turns up with cirrhosis and didn't even know they had liver disease before, like Robin's patients. Most often it was um, the, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and that's like the leading cause of cirrhosis now. It can be associated with just obesity, not necessarily diabetes, but if you have diabetes and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you're much more likely to progress on to more advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. Now with diabetes and cirrhosis, you're, the patient's at higher risk for poor outcomes. They're, they have a higher risk of death from chronic liver disease if they have type 2 diabetes and cirrhosis. And they're more likely for all the complications of cirrhosis. So the ascites, the renal dysfunction that goes with liver dysfunction, hepatic encephalopathy, the ammonia buildup, bacterial infections, and then the um, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, people with diabetes get more ascites and they're more likely to have the refractory ascites that doesn't respond to diuretics and they have to try to put all these shunts in. Uh, they're more likely to get hepatocellular carcinoma than a person with cirrhosis who doesn't have diabetes and they're more likely to die from hepatocellular carcinoma than a person who has cirrhosis but doesn't have diabetes. The same goes for the bacterial infections and for hepatic encephalopathy. Um, the hepatic encephalopathy in people with diabetes could result from, be increased, I should say, from a number of factors, some of which are countered by some of the diabetes medications. So, People with diabetes tend to make more ammonia uh, than people without diabetes when they have cirrhosis due to um, something to do with the glutaminase uh, enzyme. And it looks like metformin probably alters that so that they're less likely to make the ammonia. So there's a, you know, that benefit from patients with um, <clears throat> cirrhosis continuing the metformin if they have diabetes. In addition, other things that can happen with diabetes like increased inflammation and the, the gut dysmotility can maybe increase the risk of hepatic encephalopathy. And also we don't use a lot of acrobose in our country because of the, the gas and the GI things. 
Uh, other countries use a lot more of it, but it can also reduce uh, ammonia levels and helps keep the postprandial blood sugars down. Um, on the other hand, if somebody gets cirrhosis and didn't have diabetes, they're more likely to have abnormal glucose tolerance after they get cirrhosis. Um, and so that's called hepatic, hepatogenesis. This, uh, I can't ever say that. A pathogenic diabetes, it's hard to say. Um, where the liver disease actually causes the diabetes as opposed to uh, having coexisting. Um, liver disease can alter all, all the things that cause diabetes. It can cause increased insulin resistance. It can cause the beta cells not to work. Um, through the things that build up in liver disease. And so um, getting diabetes from liver disease is often under-recognized. Um, it's more frequent in people with certain types of uh, liver disease, especially hepatitis C, which I think we've all heard of, but also alcohol-related um, cirrhosis is more likely to cause diabetes than some other forms of cirrhosis. Um, it's hard to know if the diabetes is just typical type 2 diabetes or is it due to the liver disease. If it's due to the liver disease and the patient gets a liver transplant, the diabetes goes away. If it was type 2 diabetes, the, the diabetes doesn't go away with a liver transplant. And it's really hard if somebody's getting diabetes when they have cirrhosis, often that postprandial blood sugar will go high well before the fasting blood sugar goes high. So screening with a fasting blood sugar is unreliable. And also, as I'll show you in a minute, screening with an A1C is unreliable. So you kind of have to be a good detective if your patient has cirrhosis and you want to be checking to see if they're developing uh, impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes. Uh, they're less likely to get the microvascular and macrovascular complications, but they're more likely to die of the liver complications. It's not good to get diabetes when you have cirrhosis. Um, now, A1C is really unreliable in people with cirrhosis, and I, I've taken care of a lot of patients with cirrhosis and diabetes, and the A1Cs will be like 5%, and their blood sugars can be horrible. And people with cirrhosis but without diabetes can often have A1Cs of like 3%, and that's because they have shut such a shortened red blood cell lifespan. And remember that anything that prolongs the red blood cell lifespan, like iron deficiency, causes a falsely high uh, A1C, but anything that shortens that red blood cell lifespan causes a falsely low. So it's just frankly um, uh, unreliable in people with cirrhosis um, due to that hypersplenism and probably some other factors. Um, so you can't really rely on that when you're monitoring your patients with uh, cirrhosis or trying to diagnose someone with cirrhosis and monitor to see if they're getting diabetes. As in all forms of uh, type 2 diabetes or non-type 1 diabetes, lifestyle is the bottom layer of uh, treatment, but it's really hard when somebody has cirrhosis because they're often malnourished, and so you don't want to put them on a hypocaloric diet. And as the, you know, especially if they have ascites or some of these other complications, physical activity becomes harder and harder for them uh, to do. One thing that I would try to get my patients to do, which isn't necessarily easy for them to do, but would be to get in a swimming pool because the pressure from the water and the swimming pool could sometimes actually help act like a diuretic. Uh, and, but it, but it, this population, it's not really easy uh, to do that with. Uh, metformin, often people would stop metformin when the patient got abnormal liver test or when they got cirrhosis. But studies, and I'll show you uh, one of the big studies at a Mayo Clinic, studies have shown that metformin not only reduces that ammonia formation and, and uh, hepatic encephalopathy, but it reduces the risk of developing that hepatocellular carcinoma, which is, is a big deal in somebody with cirrhosis. 
Um, and, and studies have shown that it is safe to use metformin in patients with cirrhosis, that developing lactic acidosis is very, very rare in the patients with cirrhosis. Um, so this study um, showed that uh, metformin doesn't hurt the liver. And so it's, I just saw it two weeks ago with the primary care group here, somebody's liver test went up and so they stopped the metformin. Um, that's not an indication to stop metformin. And so this study just said, you know, don't stop metformin. It's most likely that they have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or something else. It's unlikely to be the metformin causing liver problems. So I wanted to clear that up. And then this study from Mayo showed that, um, that they went in with the premise that when somebody gets cirrhosis, then, okay, my patient with diabetes has cirrhosis, I have to stop the metformin. And they looked at the patients who stayed on metformin and the patients who discontinued metformin. And the patients who stayed on metformin had a significantly uh, better life expectancy, better survival. So this is their data. And I don't, so overall, um, I mean, we're talking several years longer life expectancy if they continued the metformin, even in the people with the advanced uh, child B and C um, uh, liver disease. So it was an independent predictor of survival. And so their conclusion, and again, they also saw that the lactic acidosis didn't even happen. And that's why people were stopping the metformin because of the fear of that. And none of their patients got it. Um, so that metformin should be continued. And so Grace's patient had continued the metformin and Robin's patient had continued the metformin. So that's really good. And you can feel reassured that you, that, that wasn't wrong. Um, now, on the other hand, glipizide and gliburide can get patients with cirrhosis into bad trouble with hypoglycemia. And if they happen to have alcohol-related cirrhosis, very commonly alcohol-related cirrhosis and alcoholic pancreatitis run together. And so there's often decreased beta cell uh, function and so that the these secretagogues aren't even going to work very well, but the big risk is the hypoglycemia um, that can happen with cirrhosis and especially with the sulfonylureas. Um, TZDs are now, pioglitazone in particular, has been shown to help people before the stage of cirrhosis, <laughs> uh, but once they get to cirrhosis uh, with the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, but once they get to cirrhosis, you have to be really careful about the fluid retention. And then we mentioned acarbose can be uh, useful for preventing hepatic encephalopathy plus helping with the postprandial. Um, now, are the SGLT2 inhibitors safe? Well, they're safe. There's no buildup. Uh, they didn't cause any higher risk of any type of side effects. The exciting thing is because they kind of work like a diuretic, but in a different mechanism, it may actually be a safer way of treating ascites due to cirrhosis. And I found uh, papers thinking that this would happen, but I haven't been able to find the papers with any studies showing and proving that. So if anybody finds them, please share them with me and I'm gonna keep looking because I think this is really important for us to have a handle on. Um, uh, the GPP-4 inhibitors don't build up in cirrhosis and so they don't become toxic and the dose doesn't have to be reduced, so they're safe to use. The GLP-1 receptor agonists either have a renal excretion or just are metabolized in the body and don't go through the liver or the kidney, so some of them are safe to use in kidney disease and some of them are, all of them are safe to use in liver disease. Um, but there's not a lot of data as to whether they're, they're, so they have safety data, but whether they're better, worse or not to use in people with liver disease is unclear. 
we do know that uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonist can help reduce the fatty liver, um, especially if they cause weight loss. But we need more data. But obviously, they worked in Grace's patient and they worked in Robin's patient. Um, so they are effective. And, and so that's kind of exciting and we need to watch uh, for that. Insulin therapy can be tricky because as you develop cirrhosis, as I showed, the insulin resistance can get worse, but then if you get decompensated cirrhosis, then you can't clear the insulin and you can't have gluconeogenesis and you're at much higher risk for hypoglycemia. And that may be what Robin's patient's kind of experiencing. She needs a lot of insulin, but she's that, that very fragile line between high and low uh, blood sugar. So in summary, uh, diabetes increases the risk of cirrhosis and the risk of death and uh, complications from cirrhosis. On the other hand, cirrhosis can cause the development of diabetes. Uh, A1C is unreliable in cirrhosis and several people are calling out the role of continuous glucose monitoring and trying to aim for a time and range as opposed to a certain A1C. Uh, a new study showed that even getting to 50% of the blood sugars to time and range, that the official recommendation is to get at least 70% time and range, but a new study shows if you can even get 50%, that that markedly improves things for your patient. And then coexisting cirrhosis requires extra considerations for the medications. Know that you're safe using the metformin. The patients actually benefit and have longer survival, so don't feel um, because we've, we've all think, oh, we have to stop the metformin. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors are safe and maybe even beneficial if the patient has ascites. Uh, GLP-1 receptors are safe. We just need to learn a little bit more. You have to be careful with insulin and probably avoid glibiride and glipizide. So we have a couple of minutes left for comments or questions. If you guys want to make any comments uh, yes. or Definitely. Thank you for that, yeah. uh, Carol. We do have a couple comments and questions off on the side. I'll just, okay. I think we only have like maybe two or three. So I'll just go ahead and ask you them. Uh, Candy is uh, saying someone with somebody who has the NFLD and cirrhosis, is there a way to determine they have it before they were diagnosed? So once they're at the level of cirrhosis doing, a, I mean, usually all you're going to see is scar tissue when they do the biopsy. So it's sometimes hard to know, um, just like in Robin's patient, it's hard to know if that was the cause. Uh, you need to rule out hepatitis C and hepatitis B, which you can do through serology. And there's a few other things that you might want to, like alpha antitrypsin and all that kind of thing. But to do a, a biopsy and see if it was due to fatty liver, by the time it's cirrhosis, you often can only see scar tissue and you can't tell. Uh, what I've done with some of my patients in the past was go back and look if they had a CAT scan, did it show fatty liver on the CAT scan? You know, did it show the, the classic fatty liver or if they had an ultrasound? Or, you know, tr I, I would try to be a good detective and go back because once they're at the stage of cirrhosis, the biopsy isn't very helpful for telling what caused it. Meryl. Are you gonna, do you wanna say something, Meryl? Okay, no, you're, you're saying goodbye. Okay, goodbye. She's leaving. Yeah, we are at that, that hour, but uh, okay, definitely. Okay, so any, any, I don't know if that helped that with that answer, but yeah, doing the biopsy at that point, but I, I would definitely go back and see if they had any, um, it's really hard for patients. Uh, I, I remember a patient that's like Robbins who just came, came down with cirrhosis and had no pre-warning and, Man, her anger was really uh, hard to, it's hard for her to cope with and for everybody around her to cope with. Um, but, but it looked like her, my patient had been the fatty liver, the non-alcoholic fatty liver. Other questions, Eric? There are, there's uh, at least one more and Robin has a comment as well. I'll just read off Robin's, is, any comments on beta blockers and uh, statins in these patients? Uh, yes, the beta blockers, oops. I don't want to share anymore. 
<laughs> I'll share and then I'll stop sharing. And we do have one more question after Robin's as well. Okay. Yeah, the beta, I just read something about beta blockers combined with metformin is extra good or something. But yeah, now there are certain beta blockers, especially if they have varicel, uh, the varices, the esophageal varices. Um, I'll see if I can find that, that. I didn't put it in here. I took it out because I thought I had too many slides. Um, but I was I'll mainly asking because she's on carvedilol for her heart condition. But now that she's got that, which would it be better to add the propranolol or natalol, which is for the cirrhosis? <laughs> yeah, so. and that's hard because the 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 one she's on now is better for diabetes. Yeah, yeah. and for her heart. Yeah, yeah. It, you, you, can bleed, you, you can bleed to death right away from those Pharisees. So um, yeah, let me see what I if I can find that article. I wish I hadn't deleted that slide, but. I might still have it if you sent it earlier on. I might be. No, I deleted it before I sent no, okay. to you. Okay. I thought I'll never get through this slide deck. I don't delete some of these. Um, Thank you, Carrie. Uh, one more question that we have, and it is from Miyaka. I apologize. I've never met you. Welcome to uh, uh, Diabetes Echo, but I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. She's asking for patients uh, diagnosed with cirrhosis. Would you mostly rely on their blood glucose to monitor change of therapy? Yes. Not the A1C, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Because um, the A1C is totally reliable. You know, my, my cirrhosis patient, somebody always does an A1C on them and it comes back 5.1 and 5.3 and, and their blood sugars are 200s and 300s. And so you have to go by the blood sugars, yeah. Thank you for that. And Miyaka, I hope you're still on and you heard that A-OK -okay for you. So yes, she did, thank you. Um, that is concludes the end of our Diabetes Echo session. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Do uh, Carol Greenlee and uh, Robin John for Robin, bringing this yeah. case presentations to us. Um, if everybody, Janine uh, went ahead and posted our SurveyMonkey link uh, in order for you to get some CMEs and to sign in as well. So if you would just take a moment and click on that uh, uh, while we end the session, I well, believe. Robin, Robin had attached um, their sick day handout. Robin, do you mind? Are you comfortable letting others? Yeah, can we share that somehow yeah. with whatever? Yeah, of course. You, um, Let me share that, and then I can actually attach that if that's okay with Robin. To um, do you guys see that? Okay, the sick day yeah, management. It's wonderful. Thing. Okay, you yeah, can edit it and whatever you want to do with it. So, okay. but I was trying to squeeze everything on one sheet because okay. otherwise it would just get thrown away. So it is a little bit tight, but I tried to make it big font and. Okay. Yeah. And if it's okay, I'll go ahead and we'll send it in with the email once uh, Janine yeah. uh, compiles all that. And if you want to share the slide deck that I sent you, mm -hmm. you can share that too. Oh, okay. Um, all I did was remove that first case. So, um, okay. and then I'll look for the beta blocker information. And statins? And statins. Yeah. Okay, so guys, thank you so much once again for joining us. To all those who are new, welcome. We're doing this every second Thursday of the month at noon. Um, I usually send out, or we usually send out emails on that one as well. So keep a lookout for that one. So um, this concludes the end. Again, thank you so okay, much. You guys, wear your mask and stay safe. There you okay. go.